The Senate will be back in session this week after a month-long recess and with just over two months until those midterm elections, there are several big-ticket items on the agenda. CNN's Daniela Diaz joins us now from Capitol Hill. Uh, Daniela, uh, what are they expecting to start on with this week? Sarah, lawmakers have been gone the entire month of August, spending time in their home states, meeting with constituents. But now the Senate is going to be back on Tuesday after this Labor Day weekend. And the first thing they're going to tackle, Sarah, is government funding. Of course, government funding runs out September 30th at midnight. Uh, Democrats and Republicans don't want a government shutdown, so they're going to try to work on some sort of short-term funding resolution uh, before then to avoid a government shutdown. Additionally, uh, the Senate is going to continue trying to confirm federal judges nominated by President Joe Biden. Democrats can, of course, do that along party lines without any Republican support. They're going to continue to do that. And lastly, there's also going to be, uh, there's been momentum to try to put legislation to codify same-sex marriage into federal law on the Senate floor. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has not yet said when he plans to do that, but of course that has become a priority in the wake of the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade. Uh, Democrats, of course, wanting to codify same-sex marriage, and of course also uh, Democrats wanting to put some Republicans uh, on the record for that tough vote, especially those that are facing tough re-election races, such as Senator Ron Johnson in Wisconsin. So we expect those ticket items to take place when they're back on Tuesday, and then after that, of course, just a week after, the House is back in session as well. But the priority being, Sarah, that these lawmakers want to go back to their home states, especially those in the Senate facing tough midterm races and, of course, all House members that are up in the midterms so that they can campaign and meet with constituents. So they're going to try to get this done as quickly as possible so they can go to their home states. Sarah. Daniela Diaz, lots going on there on the Hill coming up this week. Thank you so much. With me now is David Swerdlick, a CNN political commentator and a senior staff editor for New York Times Opinion. Tim Naftali is a CNN presidential historian and the former director of the Nixon Presidential Library. David, uh, thank you both, by the way, for, for coming on on this Sunday on a holiday weekend. We appreciate you coming on. Uh, David, Biden is returning to the campaign trail tomorrow, heading to key midterm states like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. Uh, this has come after his really fiery, probably the most fiery speech, if I dare to say, uh, where he called out MAGA Republicans and warned that extremism, extremism, the Trump movement itself, is a direct threat to, to democracy. Um, what do you make of this pivot for Biden? Do you see it as a pivot? So, yes, in a sense, Sarah, it is a pivot. Um, I think that speech was something that the Democratic base was looking for as a way to sort of clear the decks and clear the air and have the president state in uncertain terms that he sees that there are threats to democracy on the horizon. And I do think it will wake up the Democratic base as we head into the general election. On the other hand, I do think because some people have seen some of that rhetoric, uh, including his use of the word semi-fascist before the speech, not during the speech, um, it's going to make some work for him to do as he tries to persuade those voters between the 45 yard lines, your suburban voters, your voters in the, the Philadelphia, Collar counties, et cetera, who helped him in 2020. And now he's going to have to convince to stay with Democrats, not switch horses and go back to Republicans where more of them were in 2016. Um, Democrats have the wind at their back here, but it's still a tough midterm year for the party that has the White House and both houses of Congress. You know, David, you, you mentioned the word semi-fascism, and conservatives uh, have jumped on that, especially the right-wing media. Um, you know, this word uh, is such a touchstone, um, and, and it can be polarizing, um, as he describes some of the ex-president's most loyal supporters. Uh, he made no bones about it. So, Tim, um, does Biden need to be careful at all here, uh, using this kind of language that, look, a lot of people in the Democratic Party, and there are some, uh, you know, sort of moderate Republicans that do think that's where the country is headed. However, we remember the whole thing that happened to Hillary Clinton when she used the term basket of deplorables. How does he walk this line, or does he need to at this point, considering what happened on January 6th? There are moments in our history when our head of state has to explain the stakes that we face. Uh, those moments don't come often, but they do come. And I think in later years, uh, historians will look back at this moment and say that this was the time 
for the president to make clear what the stakes are, not only in this midterm, but uh, in the two years until the next uh, presidential election. Does he need to be careful? He needs to be careful to make clear that not all Republicans fit in his basket of authoritarian deplorables. Uh, one of the challenges for Hillary Clinton was that this um, comment of hers was uh, seemed as if it meant all Trump supporters. And I think what the president this time was trying to make clear was that he's only talking about some Republicans. And as long as he hits that note, he's speaking the same way as Liz Cheney and other Republicans who are very concerned about the direction that their party has taken. Yeah, you, you did mention the whole thing about saying some Republicans, and he did that uh, in his speech more than once, uh, trying to make that distinction. We did actually hear him saying it exactly that way. So an interesting point there, Tim. Uh, David, we have also been hearing from the former president. Donald Trump returned to the campaign trail himself last night in Pennsylvania, and as is expected, he railed against the FBI and the Justice Department for the search of his Florida home. Let's listen. The shameful raid and break-in of my home, Mar-a-Lago, was a travesty of justice. The FBI and the Justice Department have become vicious monsters. They're trying to silence me, and more importantly, they are trying to silence you. But we will not be silenced. The FBI is not raiding people's homes or searching people's homes with no, um, you know, legal backing. And, and they went through the process to go into Mar-a-Lago, but he is making this a huge issue. Is it a good idea for him? How might that impact the midterm elections for him to use this uh, sort of saying, like, if it happens to me, it can happen to you, even though they did go through a legal process? So, Sarah, I think that legally it's not helping President Trump that much, but Politically, grievance is part of his brand, and I do think that the more he can stretch this out, the more he can get himself back in the news as opposed to other leading Republican figures like Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. It does help him, and it is where he wants to be. There's been a lot of talk of special masters and magistrates and warrants, but at the end of the day, this thing is actually fairly simple, simpler than President Trump wants it to be. Uh, the, the documents he had belong to the people of the United States. They should be housed at the National Archives. Last year, the National Archives asked for them back. They didn't get all of them back. And so eventually, they got law enforcement involved. Law enforcement got a warrant. They went and retrieved the documents. President Trump has not yet been charged with any crime. He may not be charged with a crime. And that is that. And as far as we know, policies and procedures were followed. But for President Trump, to continue to gin this up as it's me against the world and therefore me and my supporters against the world, that I think is what he wants politically. Tim, when you look at the situation and how Donald Trump is trying to use this um, as a talking point in what many think is he's going to, to run, how should Democrats deal with this and the words that he's using? Well, I think one of the lessons um, of the Trump era is that the Democrats have to avoid getting suckered in to uh, some of these debates with Donald Trump. Uh, you, in a sense, give some of his arguments a legitimacy if you even, if you even take them seriously. Um, there is no argument, there is no defense for his having classified information at Mar-a-Lago. There is no defense for him having government documents, as, as David mentioned, at Mar-a-Lago. Um, he is going to keep saying uh, that he had a right to. He'll, he'll invent rights. He'll invent privileges. I think the Democrats have to just focus on what matters to most Americans, which is inflation, uh, uh, the, uh, the unemployment, um, climate change, and the Dobbs decision, and the fact that women do not have the freedoms that they had before the Supreme Court's Dobbs decision. So I think the Democrats have other things to focus on, and they really should try to avoid going down the rabbit hole with Donald Trump. Donald Trump has no interest in a real national dialogue about power, privilege, and the presidency. He only has an interest in getting power himself and being president once again. And the DOJ certainly laid out to the public uh, some of the documents that were there showing those folders of, of you know, confidential uh, documents that were sort of opened up so that we could all see uh, that he had them. So there is a lot to go through, and I think we're going to be hearing a lot about this as this uh, 2022 comes along. We'll be waiting to see what happens. David Swerdlick and Tim Naftali, thank you so much.